All right, welcome everybody. We're really thrilled to see you here. My name is Jeremy Schreiber, and I'm the president of the Silicon Valley chapter of the VR Air Association. So this is the uh, first time we've had a Silicon Valley chapter down here in the South Bay, and we're thrilled that this is our launch event. So thank you to everybody who showed up and, and for being here. So I wanted to start off before we, we kick things off, and I want to give a special thank you to two companies. So for starters, Eighth Wall, the, the group that's hosting here, um, Thank you so much for making this beautiful setup, for agreeing to host us, providing all of the food and beverages, and just building a fantastic event for us. We're super thrilled to be here. And for those of you who don't know Eighth Wall, uh, stay tuned. There's some really exciting demos and things you're going to hear from them. And then I also want to give a special thanks to the Analogics team, who is a sponsor for us that's helped to make this possible. They provide all of the production equipment, the audio, video, and, and everything we need to get this thing off the ground. So I'd like to thank the Analogics teams. Actually, Miguel, would you like to say a, a quick word about what Analogics is? Yeah, so uh, hello. Good evening, everybody. My name is Miguel. Um, so we actually do actual AR, VR stuff, not just the audio, uh, right? So um, Analogics makes uh, display controllers that go on the headsets for both AR and VR. So if you own a headset from 2017, and up, chances are, is being driven by our uh, display controller. So uh, good to be here. Thank you for having us. All right, thank you, Miguel. And before we get started with the presentation itself, I want to get a few housekeeping things out of the way because these are super important. So first of all, if anybody here is live tweeting, please use the hashtag VRARA under SV. And then feel free to tag any of the at handles that are there for 8th wall, for the VRARA, so on and so forth. If you need to use the bathroom, pick up and leave at any point. The code is 4351, and there's, <laughs> there's a section in the back where there's some tickets you can take with you to, to figure out what the code is to get in. Um, additionally, if you're trying to get on Wi-Fi, especially if you're live tweeting, the user uh, is 8-12-V-R-A-R-A, and uh, meetup2019 is the code to get in. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, the next step is, as we're a new organization, I want to introduce you to the leadership team. So uh, for starters, there's me. I'm the chapter president. More interestingly, though, we have Marv Sue, who's in the back. Marv, wave, everybody, if you can see. All right. And so Marv is one of our co-VPs of marketing and events, alongside with Pete Hallenbeck, the mastermind behind the cameras, and our DJ for the music portion of tonight. <laughs> and then also uh, someone who's not here, but Jotsna Kadimi. She goes by Joe, but she's our director of university relations. So if anybody is interested in anything having to do with, with research projects or sponsoring projects at universities or staying on top of some of the most cutting edge research that's happening, she's going to be your contact person. So at any point, feel free to reach out to sv at the vrara.com and I'll put you in touch with, with any of the people related to events or research at universities. Grab a couple of pictures. Okay, so we're really going to bring up the event in, into three quick pieces. The first part is we're going to do a brief introduction. I'm going to introduce Nathan Pettyjohn in a second. We'll follow that up with a presentation by the 8th Wall team with some really amazing demos. And then finally, we're going to open it up to a panel discussion. And we got a fantastic lineup of speakers that we're thrilled to have. So let's kick things off with Nathan Pettyjohn. He's the founder of the VRA Association, our entire global organization. And he's also the commercial president, I believe, of uh, Lenovo for augmented reality. Or did I get that wrong? OK. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. So while I'd like to be the uh, commercial president of Lenovo, <laughs> I am not. <laughs> but uh, I'm the commercial AR VR lead at Lenovo, and I'm tasked with uh, guiding our product partner and go-to-market strategy. And so some of you might say, well, what is Lenovo doing in AR VR? Well, we haven't announced much yet, uh, but that's forthcoming later this year. And it's going to be really exciting. I think it's going to surprise a lot of people um, what our team is doing. So it's it's well beyond a Skunk Works project. It's, it's a pretty major initiative. So, um, But I wanted to walk you through just a, a quick three, four minutes of how the VR AR Association got started and, and what our mission is and what we're doing today. So um, back uh, four or five years ago, I was doing, um, I had a startup. And we were working with uh, the Google Tango team, which many of you are probably aware of, computer vision-based AR. And um, we had some really awesome pilots that were going on with some big companies. But these 
customers started asking for a lot more than we could do, a lot of content creation that wasn't our focus. So I went to the team at Google and I said, who do I turn them to, right? Um, I want to be a good vendor and introduce them to other partners. And they said, you know, there should be a trade organization for the VR and AR industry. Why don't you start one? Uh, just jokingly. So um, little did they know I was going to go ahead and start it. So started the association really with the, the, the mindset of fostering growth in the industry, um, knowledge sharing, and then helping people get connections. But our, our motto really is designed around global connections and cross-vertical uh, collaboration. So um, enterprise and gaming and media, all these tools kind of combine in some degree or another. So with that being said, um, you know, kind of we're, we're delivering on that mission. So some of you might know some of these stats, but we have about 4,200 companies that are registered in our online uh, searchable database. Of that, there's roughly now 2,000 companies that are actually members of the association. And it's, uh, you know, great uh, startups like Eighth Wall. Uh, there's dozens of universities. Uh, there's large corporations like Nestle. Uh, there's consultants uh, like Accenture and the big firms like Intel and Amazon and even Lenovo. So I'll walk you through just a couple of these highlights. Um, we now have over 50 chapters around the world that are run by great chapter presidents like Jeremy. Um, and they're kind of designed as this, this nucleus and this kind of go-to person in a geography that can help connect you. And they're, they're usually a couple of degrees away from almost, almost anybody in the industry. Um, we have now over 20 different industry committees that um, have these bi-weekly meetings. And it's a really cool non-threatening environment that, that comes together and they build um, these case studies and these white papers and best practices. And there's a lot of reports that have now been generated by these teams um, in all these different areas. Um, and they're fascinating reads um, if, you get, if you get a chance. We also just partnered with Fortune Magazine, and they're starting a new series on, uh, I think first they're coming out with like an enterprise uh, AR and VR initiative. Um, there's opportunities for our members to get featured. Uh, we're going to be kind of like this leading voice uh, as the association in the industry. They also have, of course, uh, sponsorship opportunities, and all the VR AR members get really significant discounts on those sponsorship opportunities. Um, and then we have events. So we have chapter events in all of our chapters around the world, but we were asked to do bigger events. So uh, last year we did one in Vancouver that was kind of a, a top-notch event. We had about 1,000 people attend. There were um, you know, presentations and panels and even workshops. Companies like Adobe came and Magic Leap came, and they were like sold out uh, almost instantly. And uh, we're working on a, a new um, event in Lisbon with the dates to be announced. And then we are, are working with uh, LiveWorks and have this Enterprise Summit uh, in Boston coming up. So really excited to have those. Um, we also do like webinars. There's been you know, thousands of people that have watched these webinars. Usually a couple hundred people attend live and, and more uh, watch them afterwards. So feel free to log on. Those are all free to, to watch, and they're, they're pretty fascinating. And then we have a new uh, universities committee that's really designed around bringing together um, Corporations, universities, their curriculum, and then students and, and job placement. So it's it's a, it's a big need in the industry right now. So a lot of focus is being done with that. And we have uh, like roughly 16 universities that are kind of like these charter members of that uh, committee right now. And then finally, um, you know, our, our priorities are really to create member value. And so some of that is um, helping companies have channels to promote their business. Um, helping companies to, to gain knowledge and share knowledge, and then also responsibility um, throughout the industry with these best practices and, and guidelines. Uh, there's a great team of people, uh, all these chapter presidents, the, the committee chairs, uh, the executive team. Chris Colo is our global executive director. He does all the day-to-day the -day management. He's based in New York City. Um, he's, he's, uh, I don't know when he sleeps because he's always, always responsive. Uh, and finally, uh, I guess that's me. Commercial AR VR lead. <laughs> but thanks again, Jeremy, and thanks, Eighth Wall, for hosting this. Thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. So before we get started, um, I want to let you know if you're interested in actually becoming a member of the VR AR Association, we're creating a special discount code for tonight, and it's valid for the next week. So if you go to, to join as a member and you add in uh, Eighth Wall 15, that'll give you a 15% off your membership. And feel free to email, reach out, ask any questions. We're happy to help figure out you know, what makes sense and what works for you. Um, 
So I'd like to move on to the next, probably more interesting part of the presentation. Sorry, Nathan. <laughs> Um, but I want to introduce to you Eric, um, who's the CEO of 8th Wall. Thank you. I know this is sensitive. Um, so thank you. Uh, so my name is Eric Murphy Katorian. I am the CEO and founder of 8th Wall. Um, I'm really excited to host this event. Uh, clearly, we're a startup. Additional visibility is great, and we have such an awesome audience here today. Definitely happy to be able to involve to Silicon Valley Associate. Um, having, you know, so we're based in Palo Alto. We're frequently going to SF for so many different events, and the VRAR Association has an SF chapter, and they've hosted a lot of great stuff. Um, but for us, it's really nice to see things in the peninsula, um, South Bay as well. And it's really great to be able to host this event, have everybody here, and we're really looking forward to doing more with the association going on. Um, but okay, but I'm here to talk about augmented reality and the web. Um, you know, if I could impart any kind of feedback or anything that I've seen in this industry to date, it's that if anyone in this audience is building virtual reality or augmented reality, um, the mobile web is the place to be. Looks just like that. Um, but, but why the mobile web? And it's easy, because there are billions of phones. You know, you talk about, you think about next generation hardware, and there's so much incredible stuff coming online, but you can't get away from the fact that there are billions of cell phones in the market today, and everybody's nose is buried in one. Um, you know, and everybody's carrying these things around. And this is the technology that, this is the device that mo the most of the world is going to experience spatial computing on and immersive technology. And if you're building and interested in this space, you really need a strategy for operating the space. Um, you know, today, smartphones are the social norm. You can do crazy things with your phone, and nobody looks at you as if this is unusual. You can take pictures of phones. You can pose in the craziest positions. And this is sort of, people feel comfortable with smartphones, using them in all different shapes and forms. And for pushing new technology, this is a really good and interesting bound. It's essentially, it is a medium that allows you to experiment and try to figure out how to get things right. Um, for anyone who does development, you know, web development is much, much faster than app development. You don't compile your code. If you want to run it on a cell phone, you just reload a web page. Um, you don't deploy, you don't do three minute compiles, you don't have to load on devices. Um, and this just lets you do things faster. You can iterate faster, you can fix things faster, and of course, you can immediately publish on the web. Um, and this is really important. If you have a critical bug fix, you just update it. Um, anytime you change your software, you, you, know, you, you don't have to send it for review in a store. Um, you don't get rejected on the web. Well, at least not apps. But, but like, <laughs> But, and, and I mean, this is really, like, this is, this is kind of, like, we had the web before we had apps, but there were performance issues. But, you know, fast forward to today, you really can do so many of the things that we think of doing natively on the web. And, you know, that allows you to build software in a way that's faster, quicker, easier, and gets in the hands of more people. But the real reason that you should kind of, you know, think about the web instead of native application development is that in 2019, people no longer install apps. Um, and this is a really, really important insight and thing to realize is that like, if you don't already have a pre-existing marketing channel that allows you to get millions of installs of a new software product, it is almost impossible for you to do that. Um, I mean, the, the economics have really skewed towards like, this inability to get the visibility to download apps. You know, ads for mobile downloads have really priced out almost everybody. And this is just kind of a channel that exists with a couple of different app stores that make it very, very difficult to break into the market. And when you talk about augmented reality, this is a new market. There's you know, new immersive content. How do you disrupt in the space? And so much of what's been done to date is like building out new applications, new ecosystems, but then struggling to try to find out how to get these in the hands of customers, how to get them downloaded on their phone, and then how to get people from uninstalling them. Um, and I think the web really allows you to sidestep all of this in that there's no commitment for a web page. You go, you experience something, it's fast, and this is the ecosystem that has worked so well to date. And you know, today you can do this for 
augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, you know, today's tech supports the things we talk about in XR. And you know, my company, Eighthwell, is really focused on providing technology, tools, and services that can get you up and running, get you started using this technology, and solve the problems that are kind of preventing widespread use of augmented reality on the web today. Um, you know, at Eighthwell, we believe that augmented reality is for everyone. And everyone means everyone. I mean, if you have access to technology, you should have access to this tech. And we have been trying to do the best we can to kind of bring this to the widest, widest number of existing smartphones, existing devices, existing technology as possible. Um, our team is, you know, we're, we're made up of a team of, of engineers and designers uh, focused on getting this tech in people's hands and figuring out how we can kind of solve more and more problems to open up in existing markets. Um, you know, in my mind, the, the three most Maybe the three biggest things from an economic standpoint that people are doing on their phones today are, you know, revolve around marketing, advertising, and e-commerce. And if you think about augmented reality on a cell phone, you know that it's not it's not like there's going to be some new behavior that you've never used your phone for before. But many of the existing things that you do on your device, you're going to do in a spatial computing format. And so one of the things we're trying to do is really unlock each of these different components and doing it on a phone. So at what we do our own computer vision in-house. Um, and one of the first things we built was what's called a SLAM engine. It's a piece of computer vision technology that's used for inside-out tracking in camera-powered augmented reality. And so what it does is as you move a camera around space, it sees what it's looking at and it figures out how it moves by the difference in positioning. And then it builds a point cloud and sort of a three-dimensional map of the environment. So it's doing both simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, and we built one of these, and then we really hyper-optimized it to run on almost all Android and iOS phones. And the reason being, it's like, let's get this on as many devices as possible. Let's support five-year-old cell phones and four-year-old phones and really go after the ecosystem. Um, but we wanted to take it further. And so late last year, we rewrote our entire algorithm to run on today's mobile web browsers. So that means almost every phone, all of the major web browsers, you can do you know, six degree of freedom, augmented reality with surface tracking, and lighting estimation, um, and I mean point cloud maps and all these things. And essentially, we built this in today's standard web technology on top of JavaScript, WebGL, and WebAssembly. Um, and ultimately, these, this technology together allows us to power these different types of use cases. And we launched this stuff at the, I guess we announced this in September of last year, and then we brought it to market um, with our first partner in, uh, I guess, the very end of no November. Um, so what I'm showing you, this is a three by five card that was printed for, um, in advance of the Academy Award winning Spider-Man movie in um, November. And so what we did is we, as one of our earliest, or I guess our very first partner, um, we partnered with Sony Pictures um, to bring a marketing experience in augmented reality to market using our technology. And so what it was is there's a, um, so there, um, a, the creative agency Trigger, which is known for their mixed reality experiences, um, used Amazon Sumerian's technology to create the ability to take the main character from Spider-Man, whose name is Miles Morales, place him in your environment, take a picture with him, and actually you know, share this on the internet all through someone's web browser. And Eighthwell's technology powered the augmented reality part of this and the ability to have the camera track miles and kind of appear in your world. And I'll show a quick video of kind of, this is the marketing trailer of what that looked like. But for those who haven't tried it, I encourage you to, after the talk, to try it out.
So, um, I slide back here. so one of the nice things about, I mean, one of the kind of crazy things to think about is this was actually a project that was went from inception to completion in just about four weeks. Um, and this, again, is like something you can do on the web, which would be very difficult in another medium. And it's that you can you know, storyboard the content, create the experience, upload it to a server, and do that just in time for kind of the advance of the movie. And then even if you need to, make changes as you go. And so this was really, for us, an incredible proof of concept of what you can do with really like a very, you know, a name brand IP. Um, but again, just showing the power of this tech and getting in people's hands. Oh, sorry. Um, so we have a couple products around web now at 8th Wall. Uh, one of them we call AR Camera. And this is our hosted solution for no coding, prototyping, and instant publish AR. So what this lets you do is take you know, multiple 3D models. Um, they may each have multiple animations. You can upload them into our console product. You can position them. You can pose them. You can add buttons. You can add your logo and link offs. And then you click one button in the upper right corner called Publish. And you now have your own web-based published AR. You can share this link on Twitter. You can view it in a browser, you can email it, and it essentially allows you to incredibly quickly, without really diving into the tech, uh, build these kind of web-based AR experiences. And so I'll show an example. This was one of our creative partners, or one of, the, um, one of our creators, let me see if this should play, uh, built an AR tutorial for a DeWalt hammer drill. And so what this shows is it you know, shows the 3D model, it shows how you change bits in the piece, it allows you to experience it in your space, and it's a much more visual kind of form of learning than you would do um, you know, with a traditional manual. And again, this is just by creating this con creating these 3D models, this animation, uploading it to this tool, and then clicking publish. Um, but our, our bread and butter product is what we call 8th Wall Web. And this is a platform and SDK for custom augmented reality doing whatever you want. Um, we essentially provide the technology to do real-time tracking on your phone. We have our own camera pipeline and module, which essentially takes care of all of the challenges in handling camera feed data, importing them in, you know, handling rotations, viewports, different phones, and making it so that you can just focus on how, what you want to do with that content. Um, we do integrations with maybe the web's three best 3D content creation platforms today, which are A-Frame, Sumerian, and 3JS. We also provide hooks so that you can use any other web-based creative tool in a separate run loop. And so we essentially kind of opened up and trying to really unlock what's possible on the creative side, which while allowing you to have access to all the full power of the web at the same time. Um, and so you can do great, you know, pretty crazy stuff with this. So we have a creator in Japan who built a voxel editor called Craft Blocks, where you can place 3D blocks and build a scene. But actually, what, what I'm showing here, he then made it a multiplayer version of Craft Blocks. So there's about six or so people in this video. We're collaboratively building a little art project as they go, um, and able to do this like because web supports these technologies. And you know, this is, we, we saw this video on Twitter. We were all the team was pretty impressed. And you know, this morning we asked the question: Could we build something similar and show it off at tonight's uh, meetup? Um, and so we did. And I want to call up our Rigel, Christoph, and Dat, who are uh, from Eighth Wall. That too, or just Rigel and Christoph. We're going to show a quick demo of something very similar. This is what you guys are seeing. So uh, here it is. One person is placing blocks. The other person is placing blocks. You can actually, uh, you know, it's like a well-known mind something game that you may have heard of, uh, <laughs> um, in which you can actually play with your friends and in a, in a real spatial way. Um, so we. This is Ooh, one person is doing much faster than the other. Um, yeah. But you can see that it works with um, multiple devices. I mean, some of you here might not have a phone in your pocket, I mean, uh, but you probably have a browser somewhere. And if you, something is on the web, it just works, right? It just, you have multiplayer, you can actually have audio, you can add all these uh, interesting things on top. And the only missing part is AR, and we have it available at eighthwall.com, so there you go. OK, so I want to show you a quick sneak peek of something we're working on at Eighth Wall. So you, you heard me mention earlier that kind of three of these big areas were marketing, advertising, and e-commerce. Um, we haven't done anything in e-commerce to date that we've shared, 
This is actually the first time we're going to show you a sneak peek of what we want to do. But ultimately, you know, e-commerce has transformed the way we shop for things um, in a way that's been kind of you know, detrimental to the existing way in which people shop for products. And one of the things we'd asked is, like, with this immersive technology, can you bring the brick and mortar experience back into e-commerce? Essentially, the ability to see products and feel products and experience them with still the convenience of kind of buying them in your house. And so we've been really spending time thinking and brainstorming, what does this look like in this different format? What is this medium? And how do you kind of extend this? Um, we are just the very beginning of that journey. Um, but our, our interaction designer, Rigel, wants to share something that he has just recently started, um, which I will say, to my knowledge, this will be the very first time in the world that anyone has ever presented the ability to buy socks in augmented reality. You see my, my home screen here? I will just simply, and this will all be live over here, by the way, afterwards. You can do this yourself. I'm going to scan this QR code. Yeah, this is this is just with my uh, my camera and my iPhone. And so what we have here is a uh, is an augmented reality storefront, right? And uh, what I did was I three D scanned this uh, this pair of branded eighth wall socks, which there is a pile of over here. If you'd like to purchase one for yourself, entirely in augmented reality. <laughs> um, but I was playing with a lot of different kind of interactions. But one of the ones that I really seemed to like was this kind of um, 3D proximity-based animation um, that is almost like the spatial version of like, a, you know, like if you go to like the Apple website, right, and you start scrolling through an iPhone page, you see how they have like animations tied to uh, the way that you're scrolling through the content. So in many ways, it kind of invites the user in. And then once you kind of get close enough, you can start to appreciate the quality of the 3D scan. And now you can interact with it, right? You can rotate it around. Um, you can read the label. Uh, but then now also, almost more importantly, you have like the context uh, for what you're actually about to buy, right? So I click Buy Now. It's fully integrated with Shopify. And here we go. It's in my cart, right? I can purchase a pair of socks very quickly in augmented reality. So, like magic, <laughs> yeah, here, one fun thing that people like to do with this one is uh, see what the socks look like next to the real thing. <laughs> Clearly, the AR version way better <laughs> than the real thing. Um, and you know, with that, you know, for the, you know, for those of you who are familiar with Eighth Wall, you know where we are. You know what we do. For those who are interested, you can start building eighthwall.com. Um, please follow us on Twitter at the Eighth Wall. And oh, the slide, but it's really just what I'm saying. Um, yeah. So. You, you can start building eighthwall.com. Yeah, okay, we got it. Start building eighthwall.com. Follow us on Twitter. I'm really happy to host everyone here tonight. Um, if you haven't had a chance to talk with me or anyone on the team, come find us uh, at the end when we're going to hang out after the panel. And thank you so much, Jeremy. I'll move back to you. Cool. <clears throat> so essentially, you've just gotten a really good preview of what some of WebAR can do for you. But if, if any of you are like me, you may know a lot about hardware or software and AR, but WebXR is very much a new field. I think a lot of us haven't dove into it. And so I had a lot of very fundamental questions that I assumed if I had it, a lot of people here might as well. And so the way I was thinking through the panel is I figured we'd walk through basically three main pastures. The first one is just the vision of WebXR. So what is it? What does it really mean? Um, what are the capabilities and why are we doing WebAR? From there, I will then want to move over a little bit more to the market side. So it's great that you can do this, and we've built a set of tools that enable you to do amazing things. But the reality is the, the world is a business world. And if you're not out there to make money, 
that this whole industry is going to die off very quickly. And so I'd like for us to, to spend a little time meandering through the sort of business case and what does the market look like and who are the people in it. Yeah, so uh, I'll jump into it before. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, then lastly, we're going to go through some more of the technical side of things um, and really start to understand what are the, the constraints and challenges and where do things need to, to be developed and improved upon. Um, and before I introduce you to each of the panelists, I think it would help for everyone to know how many of you here are more on the technical side and the development side, whether that's hardware and software, versus how many of you are on the, the business side of the, the equation? So technical side first. All right. A lot of engineers. And then how many people here are on the business side? All right. That's a good mix. Okay. So I think the first question is, let's start with the real nuts and bolts of this. So like, what is really WebXR? Or web AR, web VR. Like, what does that really mean? And is this capturing? Okay. And how is it different from what we traditionally think of as virtual reality and augmented reality? Um, I guess I'll, I'll tackle that one. Uh, oh. Yeah, awesome. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that often comes up. So the, the X is just insert variable here, right? So that's kind of what that uh, web XR is. Um, now, uh, not to be confused with the Web XR device API, which is essentially the next generation of the Web VR 1.1 specification. So, the uh, actual spec that the Immersive Web Working Group, uh, W3C group, is working on um, that is uh, looking to incorporate AR as well as VR. So, that's why it's not Web VR 2.0, it's uh, the Web XR device API. And so, essentially, it's just a JavaScript API that allows for um, the browser to detect, you know, what hardware and, and other things are there to create these AR and VR experiences. So at a very um, quick level, that's what it is. Um, and the WebXR device API, if anyone's interested in that, I'll be more than happy to share some slides with the group or something like that that kind of goes into, you know, calling a session, um, identifying if you have the device, calling the session, running a render loop, and then exiting, and, and some of the more uh, technical parts of it. But, but that at the high level is just, you know, how can you have VR and AR um, distributed by the web uh, using mainly WebGL and then JavaScript. And, and why, why is that a concern? Why do we care about distributing it through the web? Like so many great headsets are being pulled out there. There are so many great apps that people can download from the leading vendors. Like what's the real benefit? If I'm an end user and I'm trying to get into to augmented reality, why does this matter? Um, yeah, that, that that's a great question. There's a lot of you know. I think it's very much a you know a rising tide that's going to float all boats. So there's there's no wrong way to do it. Um, there's benefits of the web. Uh, we looked at doing something browser based because when we looked at it, you know, we came to the conclusion that you know browsers are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Uh, Eric talked a little bit about uh, a billion smartphones. Um, uh, you know, there's tens of uh, millions of VR headsets. There's millions of smartphones. There's billions of web-connected digital displays. So if you do something on a browser, the reach that you can have, this like delivery infrastructure is enormous. Uh, so the reach is incredible. The second thing is this, the speed and iteration of development, and then particularly for changing, is, is dramatically different on the web. As Eric said, yeah, we did something with Spider-Verse in, in, in a month when if you had tried to do that as a native app across all platforms for global release of a movie, it would have taken you know, years and millions of dollars. Um, and then on top of that, if you want to make a change, you go in, you make the change, you refresh you know, you know, the browser, and the change is instantaneously available. So for us, that's one of the things, those are some of the factors that led us to say, you know, the, the browser is the place we're going to make our bets. In addition to what they've said, I mean, the one thing fundamentally that was interesting about the web was the option of view source and how important that was for developers to learn from what other developers are doing and to be able to view the source. And that's something that you don't get in a closed and app environment. And I feel like you know, it's one of the huge benefits that started uh, like a lot of what we think about you know, f people's first exposures to development and like to programming in you know, basic HTML and stuff. It's, View source. Oh my gosh! Like this is amazing. I have access to all that, and so that theme is just so important in terms of onboarding new developers and more developers, and really democratizing content creation. And actually, so that that brings up an interesting question, which is when I tried to learn web development years and years ago, it was a lot of really ugly HTML and CSS, and it was really hard to kind of pick up and figure things out. 
And from what I've seen uh, on the Amazon Sumerian interface and even the eighth wall is a lot of this seems like it's much more drag and drop and it simplifies and streamlines a lot of the development process. Do you think the way the, 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 the WebXR world is going to get developed is going to be a lot more intuitive, which, which opens up the playing field for more developers than we, we traditionally have seen? I mean, the web has come a very long way in the last 20 years. Um, you know, the APIs for a lot of different things have been refined and refined. And really, the focus has become, everything is much simpler. Everything is much clearer. Um, web pages look like they're supposed to nowadays. I mean, it's been like a really kind of a great progression. And then, of course, there's now access to camera data, sensor data, the ability to kind of be able to tie all this stuff together and very, I mean, you know, JavaScript used to be slow. Then it got fast. And now it's at the point that things that you would write in native code are actually on par with a lot of kind of the compiled JavaScript you can do. Like this is ASM.js WebAssembly. And it really has enabled a lot of the things that people have thought about in, in um, native use cases. Um, but overall, you know, the, then you know, it's like even on the horizon, Damon referred to the Immersive Web Working Group. And they're working on the standards that are going to support kind of the next generation set of devices so that you can have a standard language for viewing augmented reality experience in a HoloLens 2 and a Magic Leap on a cell phone and being able to kind of program once and hit these different surfaces. And so there's, you know, really good work is being done to make this as easy as possible for immersive technology. And so that, that brings up a good transition point then maybe, which is right now we're developing for mobile devices because that's what's out there. That's what we have in our pockets. And a lot of the, the hardware startups that have been trying to develop for the space They've had a hard time, especially when you're looking at the consumer landscape. And so in the short term, there may not be a, a consumer-friendly headset that you can wear that's really going to bring that immersive experience. But right now, today, you've got a cell phone. Everyone in this room has a cell phone in their pocket that you can build for. So that's great for today. But what happens five years out when headsets start to hit the market? Or maybe it's 10 years out. You know, We can argue all day long as who's going to build that, that killer headset. But what does the web look like for XR? five years out, 10 years from out, when you have both mobile devices and head-worn devices, or, or face tech, as some others are calling it, how do you envision that playing out? And how do people start? How do you access that web? Um, and let's, let's kind of open that up. Um, well, I guess I'll jump in, because the, the one thing where I look at immersive web, and what's cool about web is, is that it's not just about XR, right? I think that's, that's one of the issues that I see a lot of, is that people get caught in this whole AR and VR debate. And the thing about the web is, it's the web. And, and so XR is just an extension of, so it's like Bluetooth. There's web Bluetooth. There's web payments APIs. There's web credentials. And, and, and so I think that if we're going five and 10 years in the future, the, the, the immersive web is just going to be an extension of the web, because that's what this is, right? And, and, and that's where I think a lot of people kind of get lost is, uh, as, as web developers, um, because web developers, uh, I was presenting at Developer Week just two weeks ago, and I pulled a room of about 50 people. Um, not one person in that room was developing in VR and, and AR, right? Um, and, and not one person in that room was even using 3D. And, and so what I think is, is interesting is because they're intimidated because they look at it as not an extension of the web. They look at it as like, oh, I'm going to build this VR application. I'm going to build this web AR application. And, and then automatically now that is outside of the wheelhouse of what I'm used to. And, and so I, I personally think that the immersive web is, is not just about what display do I have on my face. It's about how am I interacting with the sensors that are in this space that I'm commuting, uh, communicating with in, in web Bluetooth. How am I communicating with other people? And, and so in that sense of immersion um, kind of kind of goes a little bit different in, in my eyes. You're actually seeing a ne more natural evolution. This isn't we've jumped into the metaverse or we've jumped into second life and everything is around us. But it's actually you're starting with the web more or less the way we know it and then starting to slowly delve into these immersive experiences. It, it adds that layer. You know, I would love to see um, in time how many people there is a conversion of immersive experience to I bought a pair of socks compared to the immersive experiences that we're seeing where you have retail sitting in the checkout because that conversion is too difficult. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, when we got started with Sumerian, after you created a scene, you could push a button and then a URL would be generated and you could consume the scene and enjoy the scene through this new URL. Fantastic. However, to your point, one of the things we just did a couple months ago was integrate with another technology called Amplify, which allows you to embed your Sumerian scene in any web page. And really, it's that broadening of, yes, you might want to do stuff that is a, a, 
a standalone uh, AR, VR, XR experience of itself, or you might want to embed it into an existing web, web site or web experience as well. So I think that, that I see that trend continuing as well. A big aha for us as we got started was uh, we assumed that you know, our customers would want to do quote unquote AR and VR. Turned out that half of our existing customers wanted to improve the consumer experience on digital displays. That again, you know, like we have behind us, they exist. Uh, they've already been paid for. You already have one level of interaction with them that's usually a little flat, might be visual and dynamic that way. But these emerging technologies allow that experience to be so much more rich and interactive and robust that I think you're going to see just the, the growth uh, happen across, again, any web-connected uh, display as an opportunity to become very dynamic and immersive, and it's really exciting. Okay, so then let, let's talk about what, what does this world look like from a business perspective then? It sounds like there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of devices, and that number of devices is just continuing to grow. How big of an opportunity do you see this being, and where do you think some of the starting experiences are, and when, where do you see this going? <laughs> I would say it is an interesting thing when people say, like, okay, what's the total addressable market? You know, we see these slides all the time. It's like, oh, billions of devices. Like, even today, there's supposedly half a billion devices, or now a billion devices that have AR kit and AR core installed and available. And yeah, this could relate back to what Eric was saying, but you know, honestly, I don't know any small startup that has done a million dollars in revenue off of a billion addressable market. And that's a huge problem. And you know, it could be because it's not distributed properly on the web where more people are gonna have access to it. It could be because those experiences are single instance experiences and we need the AR cloud that's gonna allow for uh, easy social or easy persistent experiences. It could be just business factors where again, if yeah, people are pretty set on their phone usage and if you aren't augmenting phone behaviors like communication that Snapchat's doing or what others are already like doing in the space, it's hard for small startups to really make an impact. But when I look at, you know, like when people put me these huge total addressable numbers, I look at the data and I'm just like, okay, who's actually making money? Where's the revenue coming from? And I kind of track it from a ground level. And so in that sense, you know, we haven't seen it really come up except for in marketing and in advertising and places where large companies have an unfair advantage and are smartly using, uh, you know, mobile AR for product visualization and showing that, yes, it can move the needle when people can, they'll have less returns or more people are likely to buy if they're visualizing the product first in the environment where they're going to use it. But when I think about, as an investor focusing on early stage startups, how do small startups uh, benefit? I still have yet to see that. And I feel like we're trying to see people solve some of the problems to reduce the friction. But I think you also have to be realistic about how actually addressable that billion dollar or billions of screens really are. Sorry to throw cold water on everything. <laughs> Yeah, I may have alluded to this a bit. <laughs> it's funny. I mean, I think people know what phones are good for, and they use them for these things. I mean, you check the weather, you get your news, you email people, you scroll through feeds of so, you know, social feeds. There's an entertainment use case. You buy things. Um, but, you know, a lot of, I mean, this, this isn't really going to be fundamentally changing. And the question I've said is, like, how many of these things that you do are better in a more immersive and a more physical way. And the ones, I mean, I've, I've referred to kind of marketing, advertising, and e-commerce are all kind of no-brainers. I mean, you, know, you can either see a picture of something or you can experience it. You can like, go up close, you can see its texture. Uh, certain items, you can place them in your room, see if they fit, see how they look. Um, this is just a huge upgrade over kind of existing e-commerce. Um, you know, it's funny, when, when I think of those three, e-commerce, advertising, and marketing, that is what the internet was all about. And, you know, even though there have been apps that have kind of broken into this space over time, it's incredibly, you know, peak, and it's almost like there are 10 apps that do a lot of business around technology, but then when you talk about what about the next million companies, so many of them are really based on the fundamentals of the web. And so I think that, you know, when this technology came out for mobile augmented reality, it came out as a library that you embed in an app, and that app only runs on a brand new phone and that brand new phone has to be updated and have the right libraries and the right set of things. 
And when you look at this addressable market, it was like very much maybe 15 to 20 percent of phones could be capable of using this technology, but only if you installed an app and that app was doing this business. And that app somehow had to have gained traction to become you know, a million dollar revenue business, despite the fact that, you know, you can't, how do you get people to install? How do you do this? And so I think that the, you know, as this XR starts moving to the web, and this again, this talk was the emergence of web XR, we're going to see these dynamic shift. We're going to see existing businesses use this technology to increase their business. And you're going to see the opportunity for smaller companies and startups to build these million dollar businesses by finding the way to really disrupt these existing use cases through this technology. Yeah, if I may just build on that. I mean, as a person who's been focused on enterprise, because mine's a little different. Um, and, and so, you know, here are people that already have 3D data. They need uh, various different stakeholders to collaborate on that data in a way that's comfort uh, levels are, are good for those different stakeholders and w at a level of immersion that makes sense for the context of the task, right? So if we're collaborating, AR is great for me because I'm on site. It's useless for you because you're back in the office and then the guy who's making the decisions is 65 years old and feels weird with an iPad. So, so um, you know, that, that is where I, I kind of look at it more, and that's why I said earlier it's an extension of, right? It's where you're taking these platforms where you're already looking at medical data, and then you're saying with things like the new uh, API that came out for credential management, you know, you're saying, okay, now I can use biometrics to now authenticate through HIPAA compliance that that medical records that I'm looking at over the internet, but I don't understand it on my phone, and we happen to have one of those headsets over there, so let me go better understand your volumetric scan. And, and so that's where I kind of see it again, is, is, is a lot of the stuff on the web I hope to see is more of features of better understanding data and, and increasing communication among many different stakeholders. And, and, and that to me is, is, is kind of where I'm the most excited to see its progression, because it'll sneak in, right? It's like when you see people, Snapchat is not necessarily an AR app, but everyone's using AR. But when, then when I tell people, hey, you know, do you use any AR apps? And they say no, yet they're posting filters all the time, right? Yeah. And that's kind of the way that I would like to see the stuff as well. I actually think that's a super prescient point is realistically, you know, if you look back in the days of how tech snuck into companies, every company relies on computers and desktops and laptops and the internet and now mobile devices. And it's not something anybody thinks about where tech companies, it just sort of sneaks up as a utility that makes you more powerful. And I think that's where the WebXR really, really comes in. It's almost that Trojan horse that gets AR into to people's lives and into businesses without anybody even knowing it's happening. I think that's a fantastic uh, uh, observation. So, so then why is this hard? Where are the technical challenges? So I mean, the demo you did over there and the videos you showed, it looked super easy. You just dropped a, a 3D object into the real world. And you know, I know up until fairly recently, you, know, you needed these powerful devices like a Kinect to really, you know, Microsoft's Kinect or other really stereoscopic time of flight kind of cameras to go in and, and map these worlds off and do all this. But you were doing it on just a standard you know, web phone or regular phone. So w what are the challenges that it takes to really build these technologies? And that, that's very open up and down the stack, hardware, software, and otherwise. It, it, take, it <laughs> takes a lot of work. Um, you know, it, it's funny. It's a, you, you have this, this concept. You want to support as many devices as possible. You want to build algorithms that can run in real time because this, this is really kind of has to happen right in front of you. Um, you know, everybody always wants more. So there's always like whatever algorithm you build is you know, great for certain use cases, but there's always an additional use case or an additional thing. And so definitely a lot of work is happening at 8th Wall and many other companies in the space to really try to bring as much value and power to the web as you can around immersive tech. And any way in which we're helping to kind of facilitate that and bring it out is really, really important. Um, I mean, I think the availability of easy to use, comprehensive creation platforms is, is underpinning a lot of this. Sumerian being one of, kind of one of the biggest ones in market, um, which is just enabling you to create 3D content and easily put this together and have physics and have all the building blocks that go into being able to you know, get this in front of people. And I think these tools in tandem are making it easier and easier and faster. And we're in a much different place than we were a year ago when it comes to building this tech. Yeah, I think part of it depends on what is it that people want to do. Uh, because there, that can be simple or it can be extremely complex no matter what, what tool you might be using. Um, 
you know, so, uh, you know, well, yes, we're looking to do something that does democratize things. And some of our early customers have said Samarian is kind of like a WordPress for creating a immersive app. Um, thought that was an interesting analogy. Um, so we've looked at it and said, hey, what, there's a front end development and design side. How can we help there? There's still challenges there because if you bring in a, if you create a virtual avatar, for example, you'll probably want to add behaviors to that avatar. Depending on the complexity of the behaviors, there's some stuff you can do pretty simple, and there's stuff that you're going to have to roll up your sleeves, and that's going to be a little bit more dynamic. Let's say you want to do stuff that has some location based aspect to it as well. You know, that's going to bring its own flavor of, uh, uh, of complexity to it. If it's multiplayer, that's going to be uh, another set. So again, as, as folks decide how immersive they want to make this and how dynamic, that's going to impact the build. What we've been trying to say is, what are some things that you know, all the developers and the designers shouldn't have to worry about? It's just you know, the back end you know, connectivity infrastructure type things that in traditional Amazon fashion, can we start taking that on for folks? So we focused a lot this year to say, what could we do in terms of doing it so you can build once and then deploy, whether it's on a VR headset, AR, web, how can we make that possible? So we've done a lot of stuff in terms of, we recently released, released an, a, a VR patch. So we took a look at deleting VR headsets. How can we make it so that it's just as easy as clicking a button so it's compatible across device? Because at the end of the day, whether or not you're putting on an HTC device, a Microsoft device, or something else, the consumer doesn't care, and the consumer shouldn't have to care. The, you know, the technology should realize the device is different, the controller, if it exists or not, is different, and it just works. So how do we get to a point where it just works? So a lot of our you know, investment is on that side of things, which isn't, isn't facing the consumer right now, but it's how we think that it's going to help break down some barriers to open, open this up. So, so how does that work, though? So when you're developing for the Rift or the Vive or the HoloLens, like you're developing on a specialized stack. You have access to the GPU. You have access to, to processor memories and caches. When you're dealing with the web, you're trying to push information down to it might be a mobile processor, it might be a desktop, it might be a high-end gaming rig. Like, what are the technical challenges that come with that? And are there things that you can't do because it's not opened up, maybe for security purposes? Um, I mean, this is where I mean, Damon referred. So 8th Wall is also a member of the Immersive Web Working Group. Um, you know, we've been able to get to see kind of really a top group in the industry thinking about exactly this problem for a very long time and really is like, how do you solve this? And so the way it's being kind of iterated on and solved is you know, identifying what are the things that are you know, similar across these devices. I mean, they have six degree of freedom of movement, they have placement, um, but they also have, you know, what are their differences? Some have hand controllers, some are gesture based, you know, on a phone you can tap and swipe. And coming up with concepts for each of these things and then trying to build you know, draft specs that will ultimately be ratified and allow you to have these abstractions. So that the things that's like, wow, it isn't that hard, it's actually very hard, and people are kind of figuring it out um, and making it happen. And these early, um, you know, this, this initial spec is not focusing on let's build a metaverse for you know, a really three dimensional worldwide web, but actually it's how do you take the 2D web and transition into these immersive experiences? And so it's like, you know, if you're on a 2D web, which is what exists today, and there's a, you know, incredible infrastructure for it, and you experience XR, how do you jump into it with all the different devices? How do you experience that run loop? How do you experience that thing? And then go back to the 2D web with the expectation that that's like the necessary step before you move to kind of metaverse world and you know, ray tracing. Yeah, so Jimmy, can you yeah, well, I was, well, well, I was just going to actually, you know, go back to your, your question beforehand, because I think you know, there there are definitely clever people. There are great tools, and then there are folks that are investing. You know, in in the tool makers and the clever people and things like that. The 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 challenges that I think aren't being addressed as quickly as possible um, are the ones around. You know, how do I go from my existing asset pipeline into this experience? And so a lot of industries are trying to figure that out. And if one person figures that out, well, now that's my secret, and so I'm ahead of you. And so. There aren't that many groups that are moving forward. Um, big shout out to a group called Trio. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about uh, coming uh, out in the next uh, few months. Um, so I definitely think that, that that's an issue. The, the other one is, is design. Um, and, and the eighth wall folks have been really great in participating in some things that I've done around this because you know, at Samsung, um, it's, it's unique, right? We have a lot of different things that have a browser. So I've got a phone that has a browser, a tablet that has a browser, a fridge, a television, and a watch. 
how can I then change my experience to be, I'm having a certain experience on the phone, but then if I have the watch, now this becomes a controller for the AR headset. And, and who's designing these, right? Who are designing these types of experiences where I'm going to pop into AR and I'm going to pop back out, and what does that user experience look like? And that, to me, I think is, is one challenge I hope to solve this year, is how do you merge responsive 2D web to 3D to XR, and then what does that look like? What is the hamburger menu, which I hope is not a hamburger menu, but, but for the sake of this, you know, in VR and AR. It's an actual hamburger. Hey, there you go, there you go. And um, so, so, so to me, I think that the challenges that aren't being addressed, at least to the way that I would like to see, are more of these collaborations of industries trying to identify how do we take our assets best for web as a distribution platform. And then also, if they decided to do that, if everyone said, hey, let's do this right away, Who's going to design these experiences? And who knows how to design these experiences? And then what I want to know is, who's even having these conversations right now? Is that a lot uh, the reason why you have the, the working group in the first place, is to collect all the people and, and drive that conversation? Or well, is that well, they're, not, they're, they're not around that part of it, right? They're, they're really looking at, how does this work? And, and, and not necessarily the application. Now, the, the, the group, even though they, they do represent some of the largest and, and most innovative companies out there, um, you know, they, they are very uh, open to what an individual developer will say, which is awesome. So if you have, you know, your two cents, definitely share it because the group is amazing in how they do listen. Um, but that is not what they do, right? I mean, the, the, the people who make cars don't care about what paint jobs you do and how you change the radio on the inside and kind of that thing. So I think the design ideas is definitely uh, an area of interest, but, but the onus is on the designers the web designers to, to really start looking at this, I feel. Awesome. So we're running out of, out of time, otherwise I'd ask another 25 questions. But I want to open it up to the audience to see if, if you guys have any questions that are kind of pressing or, you know, for anybody on here. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm actually maybe a, a minority here. I'm a UX designer, you know, to your point. Um, and I'm also getting into AR, and, and uh, I see the potential, and it's really interesting. And um, one, of, one of the questions is, yeah, how, what is the user experience across the different devices and everything? Um, but my question is actually more about, you know, you mentioned how this is hard. We saw a demo where there was a, a 3D object there, but is it possible using, you know, your, your, your tool to actually see how the socks look like on your feet as you're moving them, or we're not there yet? So, I mean, this, this, again, goes back to, you know, there's always one additional feature that people want. So there are some companies that um, are, uh, you may have seen this, there's, there's a startup that's recently showing the ability to, to try on shoes where you can hold your foot up. They're using a different type of computer vision technology that's doing body part estimation. It's trying to tell where your foot is, allows you to overlay it, and they were able to kind of demonstrate taking a picture of a shoe catalog. And socks would fall into that same category. It's like having really good understanding of, person's foot, their size, to be able to put this over it. And it's, it has one of the problems that building that very specialized technology is great for a use case around it, but doesn't extend beyond it, and it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, and so while there's really been good work in the industry focusing on these use cases, again, you'll see another one, face makeup and face overlays has been a very you know, popular one and has done uh, pretty well in market. But um, you know, for us, we were focused on a more general purpose use case, which is putting things into your environment. All the while, like you know, building up a list of other technology that we'd like to build. But I think you're, you're getting at kind of what is the final end state, and it's that you should be able to do anything. You should be able to look at clothing, see what it looks like on you or on a virtual clone of yourself. Um, you know, see how you look with different things, see how your environment changes, and do things like you know, change your paint color and your floor color, and just kind of. Each one of these is going to be, I mean, this will really be the end state of this tech. And in the meanwhile, it's like with what the technology is available today, how do you build the best experience out of it? And this becomes the UX challenge, which is this is what the tech can do. How do I make that compelling and interesting and useful? All the while waiting for kind of the next big thing. Can I ask a following question? Because this goes to, to Tipitat, Ben, which is <clears throat> the larger companies seem to have an advantage in scale, and they can invest a lot of money to make these things happen. But for each of these individual use cases, you have a lot of interesting smaller companies that want to kind of jump in the space and tackle each one of these individual problems. The question is, is that financeable, and is there a business model that can be made there, or does it just not work for, for these companies to, to keep? Uh, I, mean, I think one, well, one of these you can see is like, you know, there'll be huge tech problems, and 
will happen to be a small startup will innovate and then they'll get acquired by Google or Apple or Facebook like pretty quickly because they need that or and, I, and, and they'll be integrated into that core stack and then hopefully available to people at scale. Uh, but I think the more important thing is to just understand too what has been built right now should be good enough to start building products for consumers that could you know be viable in the marketplace. And so don't always I feel like so many startups are always like, waiting for that next thing, waiting for that next thing, and it's like, no, no. What you have should now be functionally, fundamentally good enough. Sell what you have, don't sell what you can't offer without exotic tech that might not always work. And so I would say try to understand as a UX designer, you know, what are the opportunities given the crayons that you have? How can you create a, a masterpiece instead of hoping that one day someone else will design the watercolors that you need? Uh, came up is uh, around medical is we were sitting in a group and, and uh, listening to uh, different startups and people that were talking about hey you know you guys need to put these EEG readers and all this other stuff in the headsets and all this and it's like how are you leveraging the existing stuff that's out there and they weren't and and so that's that's what I would say is is you know also instead of trying to get fancy on the you know what's coming uh, design for what's out and and um, yeah that's that's awesome please I had a question for Mark regarding Amazon Sumerian. So Unity and Unreal, like these guys have been around for the past several years. People use them to make games. Uh, I personally use Unity to make my VR app uh, because they've been around for a long time and I kind of have an assurance that you know they will be around doing the same thing for the next 10 years. So how committed is Amazon towards Sumerian? Like is it just like some sort of project which they'll see whether it sticks or not and they'll kill it maybe a year from now. How come it is Amazon? Wow. Well, I, I, cer I certainly hope we're committed or I'll be sitting over there uh, <laughs> next time we have one of these. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's a really good question. Uh, Unity and Unreal are fantastic uh, uh, um, programs or great, great applications. Uh, depending on what you want to do, uh, you should use those. Uh, there's another set of uh, use cases that while you could use Unity or Unreal, Sumerian and or other authoring tools might be um, a, a smaller lift than the lighter lift. It may be more appropriate for what that use case is. Uh, Amazon is pushing into a number of you know, front end type of experiences and technologies. You mentioned uh, Alexa earlier. So we're doing more stuff that's more than the back end infrastructure. Um, and I think it's safe to say you can expect to see more of that over time as well. So we're quite bullish on Sumerian. In existence now, the BRA or association, should we, a person, or should we not uh, build a one inclusive term for A or B or B or A or R X R? R B? R B? So for starters, that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> um, but no, in every discussion I've ever had, um, no one's ever going to achieve an agreement on that. And, and I, I, don't th I don't think we need to. And, and the reality is what the whole industry really needs, and I, I hate to say this because you know, with an engineering background myself, we need some, some good marketing folk to come in here and help us with the naming conventions because there's a lot of stigma that's attached to virtual reality and augmented reality and XR. and. Spatial computing is a term that kind of softens the blow a little bit. But you know, I think when you look at a lot of the tech in the industry, everything is spec-based and it's very technical sounding. And then Apple came out with the retina display. And you don't need a PhD to understand that that means it's really sharp and clear and brilliant. And I think for us to go mainstream, that's really what we're going to need is something that goes beyond an X or a variable and, and gives us a real name that the mass markets are going to understand. I hope it comes down to uh, they don't care. I'm with Damon. So last year, the, the kind of all-encompassing term people liked was immersive computing. Um, beginning in 2019, it switched over to spatial computing. Uh, but I think you know, the reality for most people is it's like, oh, yeah, that Snapchat thing where you put faces on your face. Like, that's amazing. And, and I think the reality is just when we get to the point that this is everywhere, nobody's going to think of it as a name. It's just going to be what tech is. I couldn't agree more. I think it's the biggest waste of time to argue what we should name it. We should just focus on finding the value and the joy that people, that this technology can provide. 
Actually, one thing I didn't get to answer the question about the technologies, like underlying technologies that needed to do this. And I feel like, I mean, definitely computer vision is a huge part of this, and that's kind of some of the expertise that Eric has uh, and his team has. But oh, there's so much more. I mean, if you think about why, like, what is AR and VR? It's the interface to the digital world that feels more natural. And it's not just the display, but it's also the input. So understanding, you know, whether it's foot recognition for putting socks or hand recognition for better manipulating the digital world voice recognition. I mean, there, there has to be so much more in terms of what we're doing with inputs and outputs into the digital world. And the, you know, the visual part gets a huge, a, a, a very important part of it, but it's not the only part. And I feel like we need innovation across all of these vectors still. And we're still at like 1.0 of what we hope it, it will be a big, big journey. And so that's really what I want to say is don't focus just on one or two parts of it. There's still so much more where innovation, engineering, talent has to kind of start focusing on both the display, the input, other parts of output, whether they're as crazy things as smell of vision I mean, I, I feel like haptics, like there's so many different things that are R&D now, science fiction now, but you know, VR, AR was science fiction three or four, you know, like five years ago. And, you know, now there are companies that are living and breathing it and being very successful in it. And so that's, like, I, I feel like, there's so much more technology we need to do to solve these problems, even though we're already at a very impressive point. And so on that note, we actually hope to see all of you guys out here for future events. So we're just getting ramped up with the South Bay chapter here in the Silicon Valley. So we already have our next event that we're, we're planning out, and it's going to be at Athir's headquarters. So for any of you who don't know Athir, they're an industrial-focused um, um, AR for the enterprise uh, software company. They used to do a lot of hardware, and they've shifted a lot to doing hardware. So our theme is going to be focused around AR and VR in the enterprise, which is a huge use case that's gaining a lot of popularity now. And I think it'll be a big piece of transitional um, use case and technology for, for this entire industry. So stay tuned for that. That's coming up in May. Um, and then lastly, just a reminder again, if anybody's interested in joining, um, again, we do have a discount code for you. So, you know, feel free to, to join up, become a part of the organization. Or, you know, in the meantime, come out, join our meetup group. Um, you can just search for VRAR Association Silicon Valley, and at least that way you'll stay on top of a lot of the events that are happening. If you go to our website, you can actually sign up for the newsletter. Our newsletter has just tons of great information. We feature a lot of great companies that you may not know of, and we're, we're really here to be a resource for you. Um, to that note, you know, feel free to reach out to myself or Marv or Pete. If there's anything we can do just in general, answering questions or connecting you to people in the industry, that's why we're here. So again, thank you everybody for coming out. We're just thrilled to have you. Um, and yeah, hope to see you again soon.